How did medieval medicine affect the medieval diet? Did medieval nutritionists advise people to eat lots of meat because there is some type of science behind it? Or were they just humoring people? If monks only ate beans and cheese, why were they so fat? These and other questions will be answered right after this. I am Professor Jerome Arkenberg, and I've been teaching a wide variety of history courses at colleges across this country for the past 30 years. In this video, I'm going to tell you about humoral theory and the medieval diet, pure foods versus remedial foods, medieval medical dietary advice for the upper classes and for the common lower working classes. Medieval medical dietary advice on the order in which food should be served during a dinner. The daily average caloric intake for medieval people. Medieval religion and food. And faux dishes. But first, make sure to click like, share, and especially subscribe and that little bell thingy, so I can continue to bring you more great videos just like this one. <laughs> Medieval nutritional ideas derived from the medical theories of antiquity, which saw a close connection between food and medicine as along with breathing, exercise, sleep, digestion, sweat, hygiene, and emotional health, diet was an integral part of one's overall well-being, playing a role in the prevention and cure of disease and ill health. Like drugs, foodstuffs, and culinary dishes were classified in accord with humoral theory, which began with Anaximenes, Heraclitus, and Thales in the 6th century BC, and Empedocles in the next century, who postulated that all life consisted of the four elements of earth, air, fire, and water, with Zeno adding that each element had four qualities of hot, cold, wet, and dry. Around 400 BC, Hippocrates, often called the father of modern medicine, further asserted these four elements made up the four humors of blood, phlegm, black bile, and yellow bile, which he consisted said that these liquids, the four humors, are the naturally occurring fluids that exist in the human body. Now, blood was aligned with the basic qualities, hot and wet, as you see here. So blood is equal to air, which of course is part of the qualities it's being hot and wet. Yellow bile was equated with fire, which of course equates with summer, and which means it is hot and dry. Black bile is equated with the earth, and of course, autumn or fall, and the qualities cold and dry, and phlegm is equated with water and winter, and of course, that is wet, it is after all water, and cold in its naturally occurring state. In time, the four organs, which are the organs that they knew about, heart, liver, spleen and brain, and the four stages of life, childhood, adolescence, adulthood, and old age, were added to the system. 
while fire, of course, came to be associated with the quality hot, water with wet, air with cold, and earth with dry. Aristotle, who claimed that only the four combinations, hot and dry, hot and wet, cold and dry, and cold and wet were possible, first asserted that everyone had one of four temperaments. You can be, as seen here on this chart, sanguine, choleric, melancholic, or phlegmatic, depending on which bodily humor was dominant in your body. So too much blood made one sanguine, too much yellow bile made you choleric, too much black bile made you melancholic, melancholy baby, and too much phlegm made one phlegmatic. In the 2nd century AD, Galen of Pergamon, really one of the most influential, actually is the most influential person in medicine up to about 1900, more so than Hippocrates. Anyway, Galen added, there were four qualities of taste. So sweet, bitter, sour, and slash spicy, which is kind of would think five, but everything had to be four. Other cultures have it as five or six, but the Mediterranean is all about four. Anyway, sour, spicy, and salty, which he then aligned with blood, yellow bile, black bile, and phlegm, respectively, which you can see here on the charts, which he then combined with the previous ideas into a system which dominated medical and nutritional thought in Europe until the mid 19th century, which really actually continued till really almost the early 20th century until germ theory finally took over. Galen further divided the basic qualities of hot, cold, wet, and dry into four levels of intensity of degrees. So these could be weak, noticeable, strong, and extreme. And as what you see here, this to which was added to extend it to herbs, spices, and foodstuffs by the 10th century Muslim physician, Heli Abbas, in his summary of Galen's system, and which he also distinguished between remedies, which were drugs, poisons, remedial foods, for example, lettuce, garlic, and onions, and pure foods. And his book, The Liber Regina, became the textbook for the pretty much the one and only medical school in Western medieval Europe at Salerno in Italy. In the 11th century, another Muslim physician, Ibn Butlan, wrote a practical handbook for physicians, the Taquinum Sanitatis, which gained widespread popularity in medieval Europe, in which he graded and classified 172 herbs, spices, and foodstuffs according to the Galenic system, the system of Galen. Thus, for example, and we'll get more into that in my future videos on this, wheat margarine, for example, is classified as warm and dry in the third degree, which of course, the third degree is that of strong versus weak, the noticeable, strong and extreme. So marjoram would be strong, good for a cold and humid stomach, no dangers to prescribe it. While most foodstuffs were considered pure foods, those thought to be remedial foods, to bring your system into back into a balance of humors, would be garlic, onions, mustard, pepper, rue, dill, marjoram, mint, caraway, cinnamon, cumin, mandrake, fennel, 
old wine, vinegar, parsley, whorehound, anise, purslane, vermouth, horseradish, and citron. Around 1300, the German physician Conrad von Eichsatt used all of this accumulated medical knowledge to give practical advice on health and nutrition, starting by stating that the right time to eat is when the stomach is empty and the person has not felt hunger for too long. While one should not fill the stomach completely, but stop eating when one still has a desire to eat. According to Eichsatt, overeating should be rectified with fasting, sleep, exercise, a little clear wine, and reducing the intake of food. And if that doesn't work, or the person is an extremist vomiting, then blood should be let, as depicted here. This is not the way to let blood, by the way. And the patient should drink warm water. For health, he stated, one should eat no more than one meal a day, two at the most. Now, most medieval people only ate two meals anyway, but still. While the melancholy should eat moist food, the choleric should eat cold and moist food, the sanguine should eat dry food, and the phlegmatic dry and warm food, which, however, should change with the seasons. So in winter, food in general should be warm and fortifying. In summer, it should be light and cool. In springtime, it should be dry food in moderate quantities, and in autumn, warm food in moderation. Can you keep track of all that? It ain't easy. Medieval physicians were often in the employ of kings and lords, archbishops and bishops, cardinals and popes, in part because they're the only ones who could really afford them. Uh, going to a medieval medical school is about as lengthy uh, and as expensive as going to a modern medical school. So pretty much the only ones who could afford them were the elite. Anyway, these medieval physicians would work not just like modern doctors, but also as nutritionists closely working with the top chef on diet, influencing, hopefully, the latter's decisions as to what to cook, how to prepare it, and in what order, and with what other dishes to serve it. And don't know, of course, you see here, here is a physician examining this man's urine. There's no microscopes. They know nothing about cells or germs or virus or anything else. Just there is a wheel of urine, different colors. You look at the first slide, talks and shows that. The wheel of urine, depending on what color your urine was, that is how your diagnosis would go. In general, the nobility and upper classes were advised. Now remember, this depends on the season and on your own temperament, sanguine, choleric, melancholic, or phlegmatic. But generally speaking, within that, the nobility and the upper classes, the elite in medieval society, were advised do not eat cold, humid food such as dairy, cheese, fish, and various fruits and vegetables, which are detailed later in other videos I have here. Do not eat food that heats and dries the body. Do not eat leeks onions, garlic, chives, mustard, salt, smoked meat, dry vegetables, lentils, peas, fava or broad beans, and chickpeas or garbanzo beans. Also, do not drink beer or ale. Do eat pork instead of beef. Do eat white bread none of that peasant brown bread or anything, black bread, do eat white bread, chicken and other fowl, 
fried but not boiled veal, fresh eggs, and do eat tangy fruits, such as oranges, lemons, cherries, quinces, and black currants. Do drink clarified clear wine, which is kind of amazing because they had difficulty doing that. In contrast, peasants and others of the lower classes, so artisans, the journeymen, the apprentices, some of the guild masters, townspeople, pretty much anyone who was not of the upper class, were told do eat gruel, soups, and stews, which are made only or which are made primarily with flour, testicles, yes, you heard me right, testicles, milk, and sour milk. Do eat barley, rye, and oat breads. If it's a famine, breads made from rice, beans, millet, chestnuts, bran, acorns, or any other edible plants is acceptable, but only if the bread is cooked in water with butter, stock, cow's milk, cider, cabbage, or beer. Do use rosemary, sage, hyssop, savory, thyme, marjoram, and bay leaves in cooking. Do make pottages, largely soups or stews, besides other ones with testicles over the else. Do make them with herbs, squash, cucumbers, onions, leeks, turnips, lard, tripe, liver, kidney, spleen, heart, vinegar, and flour. I mean, not all in one pot, but those are the acceptable ingredients. Also, do eat dogs, oh my gosh, yes, cats, rats, foxes, donkeys, crows, barn owls, magpies, kites, starlings, doves, snails, earthworms, ugh, ring snakes, ugh, frogs, herring, cod, squid, oysters, salmon, and eel. But do not eat beef, pork, ham, lamb, or mutton. And do drink beer, ale, cider, perry, and fermented fruit juices, but do not drink wine. Guess what? Most of the time, the lower classes, the working class of the peasants, ignored this advice. They were just, most of the time, they were just concerned with staying alive, and some of the stuff is just too good to pass up. Physicians saw eating as a continuation of food preparation, such that for food to be properly cooked, the stomach should be filled appropriately. So, easily digestible foods must be eaten first, followed by gradually heavier dishes, as if not, heavy foods would sink to the bottom of the gut, blocking your digestion and causing putrefaction of the body and an imbalance of bad humors. Thus, before eating, the stomach should be opened with an aperitif of a hot and dry nature, such as confections made from sugar or honey-coated spices like ginger, caraway, anise, fennel, or cumin, along with wine or sweetened fortified milk drinks. Yes, they had those. After this, the meal should begin with easily digestible fruit, such as apples, followed by vegetables such as lettuce, cabbage, purslane, herbs, and moist fruits. Then light meats like chicken or goat, pottages and broths. And at last, heavy meats such as pork and beef. At the end of the meal, the stomach should be closed with a digestive, such as lumps of spiced sugar, or hippocras, or aged cheese. 
So you can imagine the peasantry and the lower classes do not pay attention to any of this. But for most medieval Europeans, their diet did tend to be high in carbohydrates, with most calories provided by cereals and beer. Meat, a minor share of the diet. For example, in 14th century England, 70% of caloric intake for the nobility was from grain and 90% for the peasantry and lower classes. Estimates for overall caloric intake are using figures from England, which you see in this chart here, that adult male peasants needed at least 2,900 calories a day. And adult female peasants, 2,150 calories daily. But soldiers and sailors may have consumed 3,500 calories per day. Meanwhile, monks consumed 6,000 calories a day on non-fasting days. And the nobility and upper classes normally consumed about 5,000 calories per day which is, generally speaking, why both monks and aristocrats were often quite fat. However, after the Black Death, more people at all levels ate more meat. You can see that in this chart here. Notice the black is the amount of meat, which is usually pretty low. Then suddenly, around, here's the Black Death, 1340, 1350, right about there, it really rises. And what drops in comparison? Dairy produce, and especially bread, really drops. Anyway, after the Black Death, more people at all, more levels ate more meat. Again, it was typical for the nobility and upper classes in 15th century England to eat about 3.8 pounds of meat per day, plus a whole pound of bread and half a gallon of beer or wine. I can hardly even imagine eating that today. Now, besides the humoral theory affecting what they could and could not eat, medieval Europeans were also bound by the religious strictures of medieval Catholicism in terms of fasting. By intentionally controlling their hunger, people thought they might get God to favor them. Eating a lot is easy. Fasting is difficult, so therefore God would reward that. Group fasting served to bind fellow fasters closer. And by fasting, one could cleanse the body of sin, particularly the sins of gluttony and lechery, to make it clear and light for the reception of divine truth. Ultimately, medieval Europeans had to fast for a third of the year. And fasting meant abstention from certain foods, and no food at all until midday, with but a small evening meal. So no meat of warm-blooded animals was allowed, no milk, no dairy products, and no eggs. However, by the 15th century, things started to change, and by that point, milk, eggs, and dairy was allowable. So unlike today, you know, what are you giving up for Lent? What are you fasting? Oh, I'm just not going to eat chocolate or I'm not going to have coffee. Oh, you would survive it. I don't know. But you actually gave up a lot of food. And you gave it many meals also up. It's like a very, very strict diet. As a result, chefs and cooks and even regular people aim to suffer the least dietary deprivation while adhering to the fasting laws of the Catholic Church. In other words, in many ways, they don't really want to do the fast, but they feel they have to so they can avoid hell. So let's sort of push the envelope 
and get as best food as we can, even though we're kind of fasting. Now, if you're in the peasantry or the lower classes, the townspeople, the laborers, the apprentices, the journeymen, stuff like that, it's largely 90 to 95% of the population. This meant an endless stream of cheap fish, herring or dried cod, or various types of plant food, bread, vegetables, legumes, and oil pressed from nuts and seeds. Olive oil, generally speaking, being way too expensive. And for the nobility and upper classes, the true elites of medieval society, it meant something similar, but with higher priced fish, such as trout and pike, and dishes involving almonds, rice, figs, apples, and pears. There was also a certain amount of reclassifying what we would consider as meat of a warm-blooded animal as meat of a non-warm-blooded animal, which we'll get to in a future video. Plus, to satisfy their master's cravings for meat, cooks came up with the idea of faux meat dishes, using ground seeds and nuts, as well as fish meat and fish roe, peas, bread, and various fruits to simulate the shape, color, and consistency of cooked meat, with almonds the most versatile ingredient, with which a cook could make almond milk, still made today, almond milk to substitute for cow's milk, almond butter, almond curds, almond cheese, cottage cheese, eggs, and even egg dishes. Here, of course, is the faux bur boar's head. So, let me know what you liked about this video and what other historical topics or subjects you'd like to see in future videos in the comments below. Be sure to click like, share, especially subscribe, as it will help me bring you more great videos. And click on that little bell thingy so you'll know when the next History Waits for No One video is posted. If you want to know more, there are recommended studies on this topic in the description below, along with other ways to connect with me. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the past.